Uh, you may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. I know many of you are still going through something. There's got to be something going on, even though we seem like we're moving forward through this time of hmm, diversity. I'm going to call it diversity, where our government, some government officials think one way and some think another way. And some of our people think, you know, they're still walking in fear, and others are starting to be bold in what they believe and walking in that. And uh, so, as uh, as it seems like our nation is under such a division right now, um, really, God laid it on my heart to preach this uh, this couple weeks sermon series is called "United We Stand, Divided We Fall." And uh, it really is what it has is it, it just one day I was just sitting there and I was praying and just seeking God and just asking what's going on. And, and uh, it just really just it, it took me back to a, a story of, of, of a, a military, um, how the Roman Empire, you know, back thousands of years ago when it was mighty and great, how that so many other uh, military aspects would try to come against them and they would lose. But to find out when you do your research on, on how it, the, uh, mil, uh, the Roman Empire really was destroyed was it destroyed from the inside. Um, it just fell apart from the inside. And it seems like that that seems to be the attack um, of how the evil and that you, you follow the money trail, you follow the, 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 the pride and the, the, the evilness of how they just want to rule the world and put it under one government. How if you follow this down, and you're like, well, that's a conspiracy theory. Well, you conspiracy theory all you want. When you read Revelations, it comes down to that there's going to be one man who will have a false prophet or you know a fake preacher or a guy that just absolutely has got powers and that they're going to rule the whole world and you'll have to do it they say or else so conspiracy th- conspiracy theory or not i'm just sitting there saying looking at it and, and seeing how that it seems like the division is to be able to come in in several ways several ways one of the biggest ones right now is through the race through a race causing such a war in in that aspects of it could be it could be the one the you, the the attack that could cause a civil war in our nation and we destroy ourselves within our own nation to where that uh, that people and, and and crowds will raise up and go in and just absolutely burn cities down make us weak and and and, and powerless at, at the point of that that anyone on the outside could come in and raise even more havoc and and destroy us I've sat and thought about this stuff. Content, sat and had conversations with God about this stuff. So in that, that's why he kind of just laid this on, on my heart to say, look, brothers and sisters in Christ, and even if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, just sit back and look, slow down, look around. Some of you are believing things, and I, because I was, <clears throat> how would you say it? I was very much in uh, in a conversation with uh, somebody, and then that person turned around and attacked me and said, "I'm the one who's blind. I'm the one who's seeing things wrong, and that my beliefs are in the wrong." And how much is that that's going on? Is there straight division starting to happen in our country? That we're seeing certain leaders as we're praising as good. Those that want to have abortion, those that want to stand with marriage between men and a man and women and women, things that are against our Bible, one, one, that want to go against Israel because they're, you know, they're just, it's not that way. It, it, it's the, they're the ones saying that they're the good and we're the evil. That even as some of the little stuffs, as, as we as believers, we say we're Christians, but we're okay with sin. We're, we're okay with that, um, 
you know, well, it's the woman's choice that she carries the baby. You know, if she, there's something that she feels like it, that she needs to go ahead and get rid of it as a way of birth control, it's, it's, it's okay. It, but it's okay that you love this man, as a woman, you're loving this man, but you've got to test out the goods before you get married to make sure you know you're going to be compatible physically and emotionally, let alone for to, to think that you're going to last for a long time. And so you do the, the bless you, uh, you do the, the sex before marriage to, to uh, you know, to say, well, you know, how do we know? We might not work. We might get together after we get married and we're like, he snores at night, drives me crazy. Or when he kisses me, he slobbers all down my face and I just, I can't stand it. I want to divorce him. Yeah, I got you on that one. That one, thank you all. They're rolling in the in the aisles now on that one. But I'm just, I'm just saying that we're 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 accepting sin, saying it's okay. We're justifying sins when God's word is very clear on saying this is sin against the holy God, and in that there will be consequences. And the greatest consequences is if you're not covered by the blood and repentance, then in that you're not saved. In that you will find yourself in eternity when you die in this physical form. Your spirit goes to hell because. You, you're, you're, you're not saved. You're not covered by the blood. So in that, as I, I looked at this, and I, I was sitting there thinking, all right, Lord, what, what is it that, that we need to, what is it you want to address this, this time to kind of just help us get under understanding what is it if we decide to say God's will be done and we come together in unity and see what your will is, that how it we're supposed to live, and what is the consequences of it, of, of blessings, of your love, your mercy, your grace, what would happen if we decided to say, you know what, I'm done thinking my way and my feelings, because here's a lot of our feelings is, you know what, if they do evil to me, I'm going to do it right back to them. They do this and push me, I'm just, you know what, I'm going to get a knife, I'm going to cut them, you know, or shoot them right in the kneecap. You know, I, you know, we think that way because we don't like what's happening to us. We don't like the hurt. We don't like the pain. We don't like the, the verbal abuse. And so in that, you know, God said, vengeance is mine. Say it to the Lord. God, God, you're too slow. I'm taking it up on my own. We got a bunch of smiling going on right now. Because it's true. I, I, I think back, though, when, you know, when I, I, in my life, I look at some things like, I like basketball. I love basketball. In fact, there's a there's a church, uh, Jackson Park Baptist Church. They're starting up their little their basketball Christian basketball league they have there. And I used to coach um, basketball a long time for their church. And um, I, I love coaching basketball. I really do. I really love it. And, and, but when I see when I when they send over these little kids and and, and there's usually just a couple that have really good skills because they've just been playing they love the game their dad teaches them you know and it, it, it's just kind of kind of cool to watch them but most of the kids don't have like real kind of basketball skills they just wanted to go play or they, mom and dad said you know what you got to get out of the house for a little while we've well, been in the house for so long you got to find something to do and they they sign them up and they're like i don't even want to be here you know it's like that's just kids or or, or that you know this they have the thing of that they're adhd and they're just like you, you you can't even hold their attention for two seconds you know because they're just like you know something went like this and they're in it, or they're just wandering off you know and so it's, it's to sit there and you, you get together as a coach and they give you these kids, and you kind of, they've already been evaluated, and so you kind of already know where they're at and their skills, but you really, you haven't really seen them. So you, you kind of give them to, something to do. You give them dribbling skills. You try to teach them how to dribble, and you watch them. Uh, which one can dribble with this right hand, or which one can dribble with the left hand, which one can do both hands? You know, wh you know which one can move, you know, easier with thinking with the ball, which ones can pass, and which ones can't pass? You know, you kind of just do some drills to see where they are, to know how how to place them to help benefit to bring them together as a team because what I know for sure as playing so much basketball in my life that if you don't play together as a team you might as well just say you're just going to have a losing season but if you, you come together and start playing as a team you'll have a chance to at least one win a couple games if not go win all of them 
And, and in that, so when, what I usually do as a coach is I, I'll find out what, whose strengths and weaknesses they are, and then I start working on an offense. I teach them first some basics of, of a defense, but, but more likely, uh, I, I try to go for the offense first because that's the place where they usually look more like chaos when they're running down the court and dribbling the ball. They're everywhere. Their own teammates are coming up. You're dribbling the ball. You know, say you're on the team, you're dribbling the ball. Somebody else will say, pass it, pass it. He's not passing me. I'm going to go over there and steal it from him. You know, it's like that's what they do, you know. And so you, you try to get up something. About, but here's the thing that I found is trying to bring them together as a team is to make a play. When you make a play, I found that there's this one play that seemed to be very uh, uh, helpful that it gave every kid at least one, a couple chances to try to score on their own because this play was just, it was just like an amazing play that it worked to give every kid a chance to dribble the ball up whether they could dribble or not. They could get a chance to dribble up and do this play and get a chance to get close to the basket by themselves and make a, try to make a shot. You know, and, and you, you see all the parents get excited because they're, they're by themselves and everybody else is all left up oh, uh, on one side of the court, you know, and they're screaming, ah, you know, because you know why. Moms and dads love their children to be successful. And, and working together as a team brings the ability for somebody in what they're doing, what their calling is in life and what they're doing to be successful and, and, and to, to, again, move forward in life. So this, I'm going to go ahead and give you my secret, okay? Here's my secret play. Because I don't care what you, what, who you are, where you're at, because here's the, here's the thing. In that league, this is, what, this is why this one works. It only works for this, this, this league right here, for this, these, this little bit of, these little kids. Because each kid is to guard their own person. They wear these wristbands. So white is to guard white, blue is to guard blue, red is to guard red, you know. And so everybody's got their own person. You cannot leave your person that you're guarding if somebody else gets, one of your, your co-teammates, uh, uh, get freed up. You see them get freed away. Get, you can't run over there and guard them because it's against the rules. So I found the rules, and like, okay, this is the rule, so we're going to help our team. We're going to be able to do that. So what I do is I, I, I get the guy, the, the girl or boy that's bringing the ball up, all right, and then I set the other four run down court and get on each corner of the key, all right? So as they're dribbling down there, I get them to it. I say, at this certain point right here, you call this number one. This is our best play, the number one play. Now, and then I tell the, all the other four, when he says, number one, y'all run up to the top of the little horseshoe there to the key, all right, and you stand shoulder to shoulder and get ready and brace yourself and stand in line. And as they do that, then the person dribbling the ball will move closer and closer to the line and run their person that's guarding them right back into them, and then go to one side or the other and go around the line and go to the basket. It works because what happens is that that person backs up and then runs into them. They get all flabbergasted of running and losing their, their feet to where they're at, and they're surrounded by this way, this way of a person. Then as they're dribbling around, they're running into everybody else, and that gives them just a few fractions of a second to get freed up and dribble up and make a shot or at least shoot it and get a chance. And it gives a chance at least to get a, a rebound and try it again. And then everybody else knows that as they turn around and see them shooting, everybody else is rushing to the basket to get the ball. I've seen this play work time and time and time again. Even the, 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 the child that is really has lack of skills of dribbling the ball, make a point. And it seems as though that's the thing, is the coming together as a team is to be able to score and move forward and to, to get a chance to win the game. I believe here in, in, in life, so even if, we, if, if the other team is so really good that we still have a chance to stay in the game. So to stay in the game of life, you need to help, you need to help and ask for it. So that's what the whole point of the coming up into the line was, that they stood in there to help their teammate. A lot of times what's going on in our lives is that, that we're not asking for help. We're not asking for prayer. I, I just had a, a good friend of mine that um, she just uh, messaged me, a messenger, just a little bit ago before the service started, asking for prayer for her good friend. And her name is Robbie. And so we, I was like, we already pray for Robbie. Robbie's on, she's on our list. You know, we got a, we got a, a lot of people we pray for on this list. But she was one of the ones that was very important for us to pray for her today. 
But it's the idea to say, because look what the Scripture says here in James chapter 5, 16. says, James chapter 5, verse 16. It says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You know why sometimes what's going on in our lives, we're not seeing a move of God to bring victory in our lives, is that we're sitting back and thinking we're unworthy to ask anybody to come and pray for us. We're thinking our goof-ups, it's our problem, it's our sin. I can't ask for help or pray for this. I deserve this. And in that, I'm just going to suffer in this. And God's saying, no, 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 no. I want to heal you. Please come together in prayer. Confess your sins. Come together in prayer. Pray and watch the heavens open up and bring a healing, bring a move, bring a victory in your life. We're sitting there where we're laying as followers of Jesus Christ. It's like we're laying down on the ground and saying, okay, devil, have your way and just kill me already. I'm just tired of being here. I want to go on to heaven and it, where he does just wreak havoc. Uh, you know, and God's saying, no, I want the victory. I want the victory. And to get the victory, you need to follow his way of living. His will is to pray like this. I just think back and I'm just like, okay, God, I remember the times that when we got together and held hands and prayed over certain things in our lives. I remember praying for people that, that was coming in. I remember holding hands with, with, with Sissy and sitting there going, okay, God, these people are in our lives. Are they to be in our lives? If they're not supposed to be in our lives and they're here to cause problems and havoc and issues in the name of Jesus, get them out of our lives. Do you agree? She said, I agree. And so we came together in agreement. Next day, they left. They never came back in our lives ever again. Have you ever thought about that kind of prayer in your home? I see you sitting there smiling. You come together as a group that's in your home, a family is in your home to pray about certain things that are going on in your life. What about this time that we're living in? The things that are happening. So many of you are afraid. You have this slight of fear. Like, will we ever get back to normal? I'm here to say, no. No. We won't. Because again, as God has really just prophesied as it, these are the days of Noah. Where the, we will be able to have victories in some battles, but we are also going to have some defeats in some battles. But evil has already shown their card. They are coming out full blast as much as they can until they, they, can, they can be defeated so bad it might set them back a couple years. But they're going to rise back up and try to be stronger than they were before because they have shown their hands of what they want. They want to rule this world under one world order. They want to be able to give you a, 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 a mark, which is a tattoo, a chip that's in the tattoo, to be able to track you, to be able to, you can't buy or sell with that mark because it's scriptural. It's written in the book that that will happen. And the whole, the whole, honestly, the whole thing about the vaccine of this coronavirus vaccine is to set up to say, okay, who's going to be so just like I'm in and who's going to rebel against us? Because they're taking notes and they're taking data because everything you do on your phone is tracked. And say so they already know the concentration caps and how big the concentration camps are going to have to be just like Hitler did with the Jews. That as you rebel because you like your gun rights, you're going to go get your concealed carry rights, you voted against them, you, you turned around and you're, you're, you're very vocal about where you stand and you go to church every Sunday. You're, you're just obviously, you're trouble to them that you will be easy. Your name will come out on the computer called the, the Beast. There is a computer system that is in Europe and it's called the Beast. And it's data that's being fed in that thing. And we're going, How, what? That thing has existed for a while now. Long while. 
And it's holding all information of all people all over the world. And when you've never done on your Facebook, on your Facebook, it took pictures and you tagged yourself when you know how to put a little square on your face and says, is that you? And you go, Doop. that's how they'll be able to do facial recognition whenever you like it. When they do the uh, vi- you think that stuff on the on the movies is fake. <laughs> no, the things are real. They can spot you in anywhere. So what do we do as a people in this time? What do we do as a people in this time? Well, when we look in the Bible, we look at the time when Jesus was walking the earth. He, he, he all of a sudden, He told them, look, this is coming. Just like right now, He told us Revelation is coming. He said, this is what's coming. They're going to find Me. They're going to crucify Me. I'm going to die. I'm going to go in the grave. And three days later, I'm coming back to life. And nobody really kind of believed Him because they never heard of such thing. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, the guards came. They took Jesus prisoner. What happened to all the disciples? They all scattered in fear. Kind of like right now. But you know, when, when COVID started happening, all the churches, well, not all of them, a lot of them shut the doors and did sermons at the home on video or at the church just a recording with a few people uh, uh, running, you know, so, a sound and stuff like that. Very few kept strong and stayed strong and say, we're not closing, we're not closing. Some of them decided they're going to take it outside and follow the rules, but they kept on running. But there still is a fear to shut down. So just like the disciples ran in fear for their lives, they were in fear for their lives, so have we seen fear across America of all Christians, of race, color, of, of, of creed, denominations, running and hiding from the, this, this threat from the government. This stuff is going to kill you, or this stuff is going to, or, or, or we're going to do this to you. So either way around it, you're getting a threat to, to, to you. And then that they ran, we've ran in fear. We as a people have ran in fear. But what now? So this is where we pick up that Jesus finally, he comes back to life and he appears to the disciples. And in that, he, he spent some time with them. He walked the earth with them. There was, a, I think, 150 at one time saw him at one time talking to them, having a relationship with him and engaging with him. Then came the day on Acts. We, we're going to pick up this in Acts chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 1. We pick up the story that Jesus is finally at the point of saying, okay, I'm going to go to heaven now. I'll see you all later. And then all of a sudden he rises and he goes up into the clouds and they're watching him go up and then disappear. And all of a sudden these two guys in white, they look at him and like, hey, yo, dudes, man, what you all standing around looking up for? He goes, just the same as he has left, he will appear. And we'll pick this up. We'll pick the reading up right here in uh, Acts chapter one, verse twelve. Acts chapter one, verse twelve. It says, "And then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olive, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they, they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying." Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. With the women uh, uh, and Mary, they, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So what happened? After they saw Jesus go up, they said, you know what? We got to get together. We got to come together. We got to be in one accord. We got to say, okay, God, what's going on? You took Jesus from us. Now what? And that's where we're at right now as believers in Jesus Christ. All across the world, not just here in America, all across the world, from China to Africa to, to, to Brazil to Iran to Iraq, it's to say, where are we right now in all of this mess? We're right here. We need to come together as followers of Jesus Christ as one and one accord and pray about all of this. 
Instead of fussing and fighting, do these lives matter? Does this life matter? Does this skin color matter? Does these babies matter? Does that president matter? Does this president uh, want to be matter? Does, does this government, that, I mean this governor, does he matter? You know, does we need to come together in one accord and pray about all of this. Instead of sitting there pointing the finger and running our opinions. I ain't going to say it. I know it already went through your head. That's what I was thinking to say. So, we're going to move right on. California's churches have finally had enough. They, they had a service in the one church they got fined $10,000. Because they broke the... They broke the California law of saying we're you're not allowed to have church. Five thousand dollar fine to the preacher, five thousand dollar fine to the church. Ten thousand dollars. That law is trying to they're trying to put a, a, a start to go across this nation to give boldness to the government, to the governors of the states to push something like that, they could get away with it. It's against our constitutional rights. We have the right to assemble. And we as a people, first off, we need to sit together and come together and we need to what, what is important for our, our, to follow God. In agreements in prayer, seeking God. Because here's what will happen. If we can get on one accord of knowing what is God's will, many of you, you're going to sit back. Uh, uh, here we go. You absolutely despise this president who's in office. And I'm going to go there because I'm going to go there until November. You hate him. But I'm going to tell you, you're hating him for all the wrong reasons. If you will humble yourself and really ask God, because I have, I have, I have, ask God, is this the man you want in office? And he says yes. He stands for life. He is for to, to shut down Planned Parenthood that kills babies. He is for marriage between one man, one woman. Biblical. But he's this and they like. What? what is God saying? I know your opinion. You voiced it loud and clear. Many, many of you have I've had your discussion. You voiced it. What is God saying? He is for Israel. The peace in Israel. To stand strong with Israel. His word says, if you stand with Israel, you will be blessed. He is for our gun rights. He is for our rights to free speech. Our Fifth Amendment. He is for these things. He is for going after these pedophiles and shutting them down and putting them in jail for a long time. So much more. We can go on and on. And to look back at what He has done for our country to again point us to Jesus. Well, he's not, he's not a Christian Christian. Are you? What if I put you in presidency? How would you compare to his life? It's just as sinful because every weekend you sitting back there rolling you a joint and having a drink with your friends and cussing and carrying it on. You don't hide it on Facebook. You're very open. So in that, what you're saying, you're pointing the finger and expecting a higher moral and, and everything like that. And you don't even do it yourself. Jesus is saying to you, He's saying, I'm holding to a higher moral as well. You want to get into heaven? Then you have to walk in a, a relationship with Me. And walking in a relationship with Me means that you need to repent. What does repent mean? That means you say, forgive me of these sins, and you turn from the sins, and you walk away towards the cross. And you leave the sins, and you quit living in the sins, and you quit doing the sins, so then that the fornication, the sex, the drugs, the cussing, the cursing, the, the, the gossiping, you're leaving that sin behind, and you're following Jesus Christ, because God says, I, would, I want you to be holy as I am holy. 
even though we live in this unperfect body, we're still striving to the cross. And not playing and dabbling in the curses and the sins of this world and thinking we're okay. So as they come together, and they come together as a, as, a, as a people of God, seeking God in one accord, what is it your will is, God? What is it you want in our lives? What just happened? We're afraid we're going to get hunted down and we're going to get killed. We're, we're afraid that we're going to lose our church. We're afraid that the, they're praying the same thing. Again, they're in the Roman empires. They're in a controlled environment of, of military control. We're not there yet, but some of the cities in this America are. Because of their actions, they're reaping the consequences of their actions. Let's see what happens. Acts chapter... Am I in the wrong one? I'm in the wrong one. This is the wrong... Acts chapter... You know, uh, you know what? I loaded the wrong. I loaded the wrong PowerPoint. I need, yeah, I need that one. I got you right here. Where are we at? That's one. There's two. I got you. There we go. Acts chapter two, verse one. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Get that. They, they, they came together. They, they prayed the same prayer. They thought the same way. They stood together. They were in agreement. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. As, as of a rushing mighty wind. And, and it filled the whole the, the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to the, the, them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each other of them. And then were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So what we have here is that, that the heaven opened up, he, Holy Spirit came down, came upon them, baptized them with fire. It gave them the ability to speak in a language. Some of them, it, it, it's, you'll read further of, of about tongues, speaking in tongues or praying in tongues. It's a language that, 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 that comes into when you're, you're, if you follow the scriptures of, of how to do, use the tongues, that, that if someone speaks tongues in the public of a, of a church setting, that there needs to be one that can interpret what is being said. Because it's a language. And one is to be able to understand the interpretation. But if you're praying in tongues, that's just the heavenly language that you're praying to, to, to speak to heaven that evil can't interpret. That the evil spirits can't interpret. But here, this gift of tongues was that they all spoke only Hebrew. That's all they spoke. When the a Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit came upon them, they started speaking different languages. And when you read further in, into the Scriptures, it talks about how every the culture, that they spoke Hebrew as well, but they spoke the, their language. You know, Egyptian or African or, or something like that. There's a, there's a line of it, what, what they did. And in that, they each understood what they were saying. And they were like, how is it possible that these guys are speaking my language? They're just, they're just dumb fishermen, you know? I mean, kind of just paraphrasing what they're saying there. And in that, it, it, it's saying, these guys are drunk and they're so full of it. And so then Peter stands up and he starts telling them, no, we are not drunk. We are full of the Holy Spirit sent from God. It is God's Spirit that is in us. And then he started preaching about Jesus. And in that moment because of the power of agreement of coming together and the allowing heaven come down upon them lives were changed. And at that moment 3,000 people got saved. That it didn't just stop there. The move of God kept going and that every day people got saved. Every day day. This, this kind of takes me back to, um, uh, I was um, following this ministry in China several years ago, probably about five, six years ago. 
um, in, this, in this ministry that uh, the, the government of, of China was coming down really hard on the churches. They were arresting pastors and they were even killing some pastors. They were, they were shutting down the churches and in such a way the people of the church started hiding and having churches at night. And in that, they, they would pick a night through the week, you know, and they would, they would go to this house and meet together as a church and that, that house would be packed full of people. And in that, they, they didn't have enough Bibles to, to go around for everybody to know what, what they were doing was reading and somebody would just you know say I studied this and this is what I learned from God that what God is saying to us and then that they would take turns from house to house but they didn't have enough Bibles to go around that they each wanted to read the Bible they were so hungry for the Bible that he turned around and neatly cut out the, every page in the Bible and what would happen is is that the next week you got your page and when you came back to church you switched with somebody else that you have something new that you haven't read That the testimonies that were coming from five, six years ago that was coming from China was that there were thousands of people every day being saved. Have mercy on America, but if America would come to that kind of oppression, that a move of God would come to America such as that. It would be horrific Something that I would not want. But could you imagine, where is your love for your Jesus in such a way that you would get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and go walk somewhere to somebody's house to, to have church at night? We, we, we struggle with just saying that, you know what, we, we, we were leaving this church because, you know what, the, pra the pastor cut the show out. There's no more smoke and lights and anything like that. He, he told the band, go... Go, we're done with that kind of worship. We're going to come together and what we're going to do, we're going to do what Jesus said. Jesus said, this house is a house of prayer. He came in there, he, got, he was really mad that one time when they were turning around and doing all, all their kinds of worship of sacrificing and they were selling and buying and, uh, of, of, of animals that were only acceptable to the priest to, to have that. He was like, this is a den of thieves. Is it, you guys are stealing. He went in there and he turned all the tables over. He goes, this is my father's house. It is a house of prayer. That we would turn and come together as these, as these men of God, these women of God got into the room and just said, you know what, we're going to pray and we're going to pray and we're going to pray. That when we would come together and say, you know what? This Sunday, preacher said, you know what? We're not preaching today. Today, we're going to pray. We're going to read some Scripture, and we're going to pray some more. We're going to read some Scripture, and we're going to pray some more. Where is your heart to say, I'm following God? And that man because he's turning around and that's what God's laid on his heart to do. That you would say, I'm going to be at church. I'm going to be at church. Or are you so bored that you're missing the show? You say, I'm done with the church because I'm so bored. i got nothing for my children. And in that, we're going to go find somewhere else where the smoke and the lights are still happening. Where's your heart? And your passion for your Jesus who died on the cross for your sins. Who the blood was shed for you to wash away from, from, from the, to give you the chance to go to heaven. Because of your sin. Your making up idols. Your lying. Your, your disobedience. But he tells you, because his word says, if you know to do good and do not do good, you sinned. That's a sin. How much do we know that we're like, I ain't doing that. I hate that person. And you're so honest about it. I ain't doing that. You know, that they, they get on my nerve. <laughs> oh, nerves. I'm leaving a plural because that really, I was just like. Where are we as a people? Are we at this point? Because I'm going to say, united we stand, divided we fall. As we right now, as a, as a people, we're divided all across this country. There's pockets. I'm telling you, there's pockets. Hey, there's a, there's a Pastor Greg Lott. His, his, his people over there, that man's on. He, that people over there, he's got people, he's got such people coming in from other states and everything to be a part of the move of God that's there. That there's also the enemy is coming there to protest. And they as a people still stand together and they pray before that service. They pray after that service. And they're seeking the move of God. They pray through the week. And the, and the move of God is doing just this. 
that even those that are coming against them are getting saved. That's this. And do we not want or hunger for this? In Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 and 19, it says this. Matthew 18, 18 through 19 says, Surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. We are in such a spiritual warfare that we're missing the tools to fight back. Do we not want to come together as a believer, as a family, as, as a, a unit of saints, this world is lost, so lost, that the people all around me, if, 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 if a meteor comes and hits us and we all die, they're going to hell, they're going to hell, they're going to hell, they're going to hell. Does it not concern us? Or we are so hard-hearted in our hearts that we're so... It's all about me. I'm just this. That we have lost the vision that they are souls. They're on their way to eternity in hell. This spiritual warfare has did a shakening. Has it shook you? Do you want to be a part of this united do you want to come in agreements with the, the, your brothers and sisters in Christ and saying God's will be done, that we be saved, that God will heal our land? Because this is what 2 Chronicles, I don't have this when this was just came to me this morning to just add it to my notes here. And it says 2 Chronicles 7.14. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Pray. Get that. And seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. We have heard this scripture over and over and over again this past through this the past six months of this epidemic. But when are we going to be serious about it? When are we going to be serious and come together and say, as a people, please, Jesus. Please, Jesus, I'm praying and seeking your face. What is your will for my life? What is your will for my church? What is your will for our pastor? What is your will for, for my husband, my, my children? What is your will for my, my wife, my children? What, what is your will, God, in my job? What is your will in our government? God, what is your will for our president? What is your will for this, uh, this abortion? What is your will for this marriage between a man and a woman? God, what is your will? Show us, lead us, guide us, give us boldness to stand on your truth. Because here's what happens in Ecclesiastes. I have this one up here. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12 it says this. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And threefold cord is not quickly broken. If we come together more than three, we cannot be broken. We stand on God's words of speaking into these things. We bind those things that are against the, the will of God. We bind this evil that is trying to overthrow the government and overthrow America. And we bind it and we cast it into the sea. In the name of Jesus. That His will be done that none shall perish but have eternal life. That's His full will. His full will is for all to be saved. But again, we are a people of free will. To choose to follow and repent or not. So where are you? Where are you? As a believer, are you willing to humble yourself Really feel God to, say, to to really start pushing to start to 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 make things happen for a, a Wednesday night prayer time. 
I'm going to get up with my few, my core people and ask them what they're, if it's not this Wednesday, it will definitely be the next Wednesday where we'll get started. We'll just be here, you know, and just start praying. We'll read a little scripture and we'll pray some more and and we'll see what God's going to do. He just keeps leading me to lead that. In our next, uh, uh, our next sermon series, it'll be, it'll, it's going to be on prayer. Next week, we're going to start a, 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 a God's Word and, and show us about, about what prayer. But if you're a believer, you're struggling with some of this stuff. And if, even if you're not struggling with any of this, you're firm in what God's saying to you. We're going to need to continue to pray. We need to continue to pray. And what will I, I, in my heart too, to teach you even more, to, to start even to, to uh, take some times in certain things, certain warfare, to be able to, uh, to battle in fasting and praying. Because sometimes prayers are not answered unless you pray and fast. I mean, I remember that woman when, when, uh, um, when we were at that other church and she had a kidney issue. And if she didn't get a kidney, she's going to die. And we as a church came together, the, the pastor, he, he was such an amazing pastor to lead in that kind of warfare that he led us and say, we're fasting Wednesday, fasting if, and, and we're going to pray and ask for a kidney. And sure enough, the next Wednesday we prayed and we fast. And then when we left that place and Sissy's like, I feel God's telling me to give my kidney. And I'm just like, do it. I ain't getting in the way. If that's God saying that, I ain't getting in God's way. So see breakthroughs happen when you fast and pray because it's sometimes it's the only way to go against certain kinds of, of spiritual warfare. But today, I challenge you. It'll start something where you're at. Maybe you're already going to a different church and you just watch online. You know, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know who's going to hear this. I don't know where it's going to go. That wherever you're at, that you will first start with yourself and start setting time aside for just you and God and praying. If you got to write you a list, write you a list to keep your focus. Because I know sometimes when I get going, man, I get I get my I start going this way and that way. And so I, I I gotta create certain things to stay focused. And I'm gonna tell you the best times is always in the mornings. I struggle so hard to get up in the morning to do. I understand it, but you're different than me. You can pick a different time. Maybe your time is at night. You get the kids down, and everybody's all shut up. You finally get in there, turn the TV off, and you set some time and you read a couple of verses of a of a of a, a a book in in the Bible, and then you start praying. Take twenty minutes, half hour. I'm going to tell you what, it, it, you sleep so much better when you can get some of God's words in your eyes. Some of you that struggle with sleep, if you just sit down and just read, the, not on your phone, not on your tablet, because there's something about that, the, that light, it messes with your eyes. But when you get here and you read His Word, there's something about straight out of this paper book that just absolutely puts a peace in your heart and your spirit and your mind and your eyeballs <laughs> in your eyeballs that you sleep better. It's just, I don't know what it is. Don't. But as we close in prayer, I challenge you this week, start setting some time of prayer and then start praying about getting together with a group. Two or three. Here's, you know, three is saying a cord can't be broken. That you would get together once a week or maybe a couple times a week whatever it is, maybe as a family, children, gathering them all in together right after dinner time. You say, okay, we're going to have dinner and then we're going to, do, we're going to have some prayer time as a family. And then bring up and listen to, listen to your children's prayer requests and write them down and then pray over them and even give them a chance to pray out loud. How you're going to see a move of God like this. The Holy Spirit coming in your house and changing everything. And for you today that don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, He just wants to tell you how much He loves you. That if you will just ask for forgiveness of your sins. He says, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Ain't no might, ain't no ifs. You don't have to, listen, you don't have to clean yourself up to go get saved. He does the cleaning. You just got to say, please forgive me.
So right where you're at, as I pray, will you ask Jesus, please, to save you? As we pray, you bow your heads. Father, we just come to you in the precious holy name of Jesus again to thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. We stand under the words of Isaiah that this word will go forth and it will accomplish the things wherein to it is sent. Father God, I just love you, Jesus. I love you, Holy Spirit. I love you. I pray now that you will give us the boldness to move forward with this, uh, this prayer uh, of coming against, uh, against evil, of, of your opening the heavens and uh, allowing Holy Spirit to come and fall down upon us to reveal your love and salvation through your Son, Jesus. That, Father, I pray even now for a protection for this move. Because every time I look back in the past and when you laid it on my heart to start something like this, it's so much stuff comes against us. So much com- stuff comes against the people that it, it, it falls apart so fast. So in this now, I pray and ask in Jesus' name, And as your people are praying in agreements with me, that you will put a hedge of protection upon this prayer endeavors of moving forward. That nothing will come against the people and stop their time or get in there and and interrupt their household that they can't make it to the prayer time. That you will bless their endeavors and seeking you. For your word says, is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. That we seek you about everything and we come together as one accord. Father, I love you. Jesus, I love you. For those that don't know you as Lord and Savior, Holy Spirit, come upon them now and give them the courage and the unction to pray, saying, Heavenly Father, please forgive me of my sin. I believe Jesus died on the cross and you raised him from the dead to be the sacrifice for my sin. I accept that gift of sacrifice. Baptize me with your Holy Spirit and make me a new person. Change me. Lead me. Set a fire in my heart to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Hear their prayer of salvation, Father, of repentance and turning from their sins and bless them uh, in in their new walk with Jesus. Give them the boldest to even tell somebody on this date, I, I, I asked Jesus to save me. Again, bless everyone here this morning in their homes this week. Show up in a mighty way. Bless their, their jobs and, their, and the, their children that, they're, uh, that are going to school. Bless to give them wisdom and understanding of this online schooling. I pray your special blessing, Father, right now just come upon the uh, those that are battling uh, the, this corona, that maybe even somebody that they know. God, I even pray even for Robbie right now that you'll touch her right now and just, just squish that stuff in her body and get it out of her right now. Even though she'll still have to follow through with the full quarantine time, God, that she will feel no effects of anything. God, I just thank you for your mercy and your grace in our lives. We love you. We praise your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you're dismissed.